Hello and welcome to this lecture on the subject of the world's first industrial thermal battery. I'm David Ball, the chairman of the Power Industries Division, Northwest Centre of the IMACE, and I would like to thank you all for joining our webinar lecture today. Before we get started, I would also like to say a big thank you to Emma Paitman, the Senior Events Executive, and Fiona Wong from the IMACE HQ for helping to set up this session. It has been organised by the Power Industries Division Northwest Centre and it is shared with the Greater Manchester area of the IMACE. The duration of the lecture will be 40 minutes followed by 15 minutes of questions. You can type your questions in the question and answer box and Murat Islam, the social media secretary from the Northwest region of the IMACE will endeavour to facilitate them after the lecture. For more detailed answers, please contact Fiona Wong uh, from the events team at the IMACE and she will seek answers from the speakers and advise you by email. The lecture will be recorded and the video will be made available later. The presentation will introduce the thermal battery technology and explain the ease of integration and operation. This battery technology can also contribute to decarbonisation. The two speakers are both from Energy Nest and they are Professor Hoyrick, who is the Vice President of Technology and Research, responsible for materials and modular design storage, together with research and development activities and Professor Bergen, who is the founder of the Energy Nest and Lattice Technology, and he is now passionately engaged with the innovation, performance and energy efficiency, while still working very actively on the Energy Nest and Lattice Technology. Ladies and gentlemen, our speakers for this lecture, Professor Horvick and Professor Bergen. Thank you, Dave. Uh, this is Paul Bergen, so I will start this uh, presentation, um, which will actually consist of three parts. Um, the first part uh, I will uh, present, uh, which is more a general overview and uh, more or less put you on the right track when it comes to what this kind of technology can do. And uh, then Nils uh, will take over from there in the second part and go more into how the battery works and is used. And, and in the third part, focus really on the vast opportunities for industrial applications and give some examples. So, um, next. so I, I think we all are pretty much aware of that we are in a rather dramatic transition when it comes to the way we produce energy and the way we are using energy. We have to do something about our addiction to fossil use of fossil fuel and of course on a global scale reduce the carbon footprint and to replace the more traditional energy systems um, with renewable energy. Uh, the, the problem, of course, is that renewable energy means mainly a use of uh, wind and sun as the source of uh, energy. And unfortunately, these sources are not that reliable. Sun, of course, is up only half the time on the average, and uh, the sun is also covered by, by clouds. And we have um, long periods also when we cannot rely on wind. So these sources are intermittent, and they are not uh, fully reliable. Moreover, we have to think about energy efficiency and energy waste. So we have to also focus on uh, how we can deal with this, these problems uh, to a much better extent than we are doing uh, at the moment. So uh, since there 
Yes, clearly, and particularly as we are using renewable energy more and more, there can be a tremendous mismatch between the time and the amount when we produce energy and as relating to when we need it. So this mismatch, of course, means that we have to do something about energy storage to shift energy in time. So this was really the basis for the ideas that um, uh, made us uh, start Energy Nest. Uh, energy, of course, comes in many different forms. And um, in industry, for instance, more than half of the energy is used as heat or thermal energy. And also a lot of energy is wasted as heat. Um, but this storage problem, that, that means we have to find large-scale solutions to storing energy. When you ask people about storing energy, they, they normally say batteries and um, electric batteries. Thermal batteries, which is what uh, we are going to talk about, is a rather new technology and particularly high temperature thermal batteries. So we'll explain how this works and, and explain that thermal batteries to a large extent can be a complementary technology to, to electric batteries, but it all can also do very many things that an electric battery cannot do. Um, so we started this development based on these ideas for storing high temperature heat um, about eight, nine years ago. And since then, we have gone through extensive uh, research and development, testing, piloting, design ideas, and verification of the technology. We have been very thorough on that front. So among other things, this has included uh, that we have we built a pilot that we operated over a two-year period in Abu Dhabi. Um, a one megawatt, uh, megawatt hour thermal battery. And this has been very useful in our verification in relation to uh, simulation programs. Of course, a very important part of our technology is computer simulation, so we can predict in advance how the batteries, thermal batteries will work. So now we are venturing into the more commercial phase. We are still a small uh, company, but we have the headquarters in Oslo. We have offices in Hamburg and in Seville in Spain, Spain and uh, also a representative in, in the UK. So on the first slide, you see to write uh, the concept of a battery element, and you see a uh, module of such elements, and you, you see also indication how we can build and assemble these modules into very large uh, energy storages. In, in, in practice, there should not be any limit to how large uh, storage we could build in this way. So next. So on this slide, there's actually a picture of a real module. Uh, you may recognize that this is uh, the same size as a 20-foot uh, container unit. And we have found this to be very practical in the way we, we assemble and deal and, and transport uh, the, the, these uh, modular uh, storages. And um, so there is a steel frame. There is inside uh, these steel tubes that you see, which are actually uh, ventilate, ventilation duct spiral tubes. And inside there, there uh, you'll find the heat exchangers. So the whole thing is put vertically and then filled with a special type of concrete. Uh, and you see a picture of the casting to the left. Um, this is no, not the normal concrete, we call it heatcrete. 
because it's for heat storage, it's not for construction. And we'll give you some more information about the performance of this, uh, this concrete. So this can be easily produced either in a, in a centralized uh, production facility or it can also be cast at site. But the main thing is that we can stack these modules together and combine them in parallel or in serial systems and get a very efficient way of storing energy and also extracting energy from the storage. So, of course, it's very important what, um, what we do with the heat transfer, and that means that we have to um, supply heat by heat transfer fluid, which typically can be a thermal oil or it can be water, steam. Uh, so you'll hear about examples uh, of such use later on. Um, yes, and um, also this, this will show you actually how, uh, how efficient it is in use. One module like this typically stores about two megawatt hours of thermal energy in relation to the operational delta T, delta temperature. And this can absolutely be compared with how much energy you can store in a um, container size electric battery unit. Next. At Energy Nest, so we are making large-scale um, energy storage an economical and environmental opportunity first. for power plants and energy intensive industries. Our objective is to help our customers to increase their energy efficiency and asset flexibility. And at the same time, reduce their carbon footprint. We do this by storing and time-shifting heat at high temperature in thermal batteries. We are building our thermal batteries using prefabricated modules, together with our strong partners and certified suppliers. Prefabricated by ISO certified suppliers off-site. All fabrication and pressure testing witnessed by third party. Flexible and lean manufacturing. Highest customer value for the lowest cost. Our modular thermal battery is scalable and customizable for any application. The modules are composed of abundant, recyclable and non-hazardous geomaterials. Each module has the size of a standard 20-foot shipping container. This makes both transport and installation very easy. Easy integration. Foundation with 3 to 5 modules. 20 to 25 modules. 90 times 2 modules. Fully cladded and finished thermal battery. We deliver our thermal batteries to our customers to help them meet the requirements for a sustainable and competitive energy future. Our thermal battery technology will enable a more responsible use of energy, helping to balance supply and demand whenever needed for individual facilities as well as the power grids. Energy Nest will work with you to customize a thermal battery solution from initial assessment through to commissioning and operation. We will help prepare your company to meet future legislation on environmental performance and decarbonization. Let's get ready for a clean future. Okay, uh, that was a two-minute two uh, movie showing a little bit about how this uh, technology is put together and how it can be used. Um, there are many more ways of um, using the technology, but we'll get more into that later on. So uh, let me explain a little bit more about the uh, thermal uh, elements and the batteries. Next slide, please. So one question is, of course, that we have these heat exchangers that are cast into concrete, and how do these two materials go together? Well, normally, actually, the con uh, concrete and reinforcement steel go very well together. That is a very common way of constructing. So, and also in this case, uh, the, it works well. But of course, there's a special problem because we have high temperature heat going through the heat exchangers, can be up to 400 degrees. And um, 
So there's a major te temperature difference between the heat exchangers and the concrete. And of course, there will be interaction forces between the two. So one of the questions we will very often get is for a large element, how does this really go together? But when you do the math and, and see how the difference in thermal expansion between the two materials, materials are handled, you know, it is really, it is um, by the anchoring and the anchoring and the force transfer between the two materials is really independent of the size. So a long element is not more difficult or more uh, uh, give high forces than a, a smaller element. So, so that's important to know. And also, um, quite interestingly, the, the concrete uh, shrinks a little bit uh, after casting and that gives a very good uh, pre-tensioning uh, pre or pre-compression between the concrete and, uh, and the contact with these heat exchangers. Next. So let us uh, get into this special material that we call heat creep. And, and it's really quite quite the difference between this material and a normal construction concrete. In this diagram, uh, the, you, we have an illustration of the two main properties that are important for thermal storage, and that is the heat conductivity and the heat capacity. So you see typically here three curves. One is for heat creep, one is for EU standard for high performance concrete, and the lower curve is for another uh, development project that has been going on since uh, about year 2000, I guess, with um, DLR, the German uh, Research Institute uh, for, for Airspace. So uh, the um, heat capacity and the heat conductivity is significantly higher. The, the conductivity is about 60% higher than normal concretes and also the ca uh, capacity is significantly higher. And as you see also from uh, these curves, um, they, th these properties uh, change with um, temperature, which is very important. In all the modeling, of course, we have to account for the specific temperature in the various parts of the storage. Next. And, of course, strength. And um, you see at the upper line in, in the um, table there, you, you see the strength of uh, heat creep as compared with, um, let's say, more normal concretes and uh, concretes used by DNR. Um, so, and one thing we um, discovered during our testing was that, well, first of all, we have to do a thermal conditioning to get the uh, free water out of the concrete. So that, that is the process where we keep the concrete at the temperature of 130 to 150 degrees for, um, uh, yeah, it could be one one day, for instance, and we get more the more water, the free water out of the concrete. But it also has a direct effect on the strength of concrete. And of course, thermal stresses is very important in um, uh, in the design, you know. And this design um, shows that we um, can uh, handle thermal uh, stresses in a very good way. And we also have compared uh, this strength with the core samples of uh, concrete that we have taken from the um, pilot that we were running down in Abu Dhabi. Next. And we have cut out parts of the uh, Abu Dhabi storage, and we have looked at uh, the um, conductivity and uh, heat capacity for different temperature, both from experiments, from testing, and from the pilot. And things are very well mapped and understood, I think. Interesting, these cuts uh, don't, uh, do not show a single crack. 
it's quite amazing that after all these operations, stress cycling, there is no cracking in the concrete. Next. And another feature, of course, is since we are uh, transferring heat to the storage, it's getting heated, and, and then we extract the heat. And these are stress cycling, of course. The, the good thing here is that we have a high strength concrete. And we, when you look at the stress cycles, and that we can very well compute from our simulations, we, we typically are in the range of let's see, 15, 20, 25 percent uh, of the um, uh, stress capacity. So it's really low stress cycling. And moreover, it's also a low number of cycling. So when we compare with a normal SM curve for, for concrete, we see that we are very much on the safe side. and. Uh, it, let's say if you have a storage where you have one charge discharge cycle per day, during 25 years you are still below 10,000 cycles, and it's a long way up to the point where you know the concrete will, will really fail from from cycling. Actually, at this stress level, it would, it would never fail. So uh, I think I'll leave it to Nils now to do, take you into the next uh, part about how the battery works. Thank you, Paul. Yes, so the next uh, sec section of the presentation will uh, describe um, how the thermal battery works. Uh, now you learned about the elements, the material, the heat exchangers, and the modules. So looking at the uh, large scale system, you will see that uh, energy uh, in terms of uh, uh, heat coming from different kinds of sources, uh, be it shown on the upper left side, um, can go into the thermal battery. And uh, uh, this, this is done by uh, HDF, the heat transfer fluid, which is typically oil or water steam, as Paul mentioned earlier. And um, the HF then flows through the storage from the top to bottom, uh, and this transfers then the thermal energy to the storage medium, the heat rate. And then the thermal battery then stores this energy uh, by heating up, and the more temperature increases, of course, the more energy is stored within the unit, uh, within the system. And during discharge, um, it's the opposite. Then the HF fluid is uh, sent in through the bottom, so it's on the cold side, and then it exits on the top. So it's actually absorbing all the energy that is stored in the storage material. And the thermal energy um, can then be run, done to be used for a steam generator or for process heat or even a turbine. So there are multiple um, scenarios. Looking at this a little bit further in detail, how does a thermal battery add value? Um, waste heat or heat demand is often highly variable and intermittent. And having a thermal battery in the center of this will then solve this and remedy the issue because it can act as a buffer. And this will then allow a more predictable um, uh, discharge on demand and also secure energy output when it's required. Um, waste heat is often peaks that exceed far beyond the capacity of the energy demand. And in these situations, the thermal battery can enable recovery of the waste heat um, and turning all the valuable heat into some, something useful. I'm useful. going to show some examples about that later. Um, but also existing waste heat recovery solutions can sometimes offer little, uh, little value because the heat um, can be absorbed and quite well recovered in, in systems where you operate with hot water. But combining a thermal battery uh, will allow them multiple revenue streams. Uh, such as electricity generation, but also process heat. So um, I'm going to show you some more examples of that in the next couple of slides. But before we go further, I'd like to share um, a single uh, viewpoint of how a thermal battery compares to electrochemical batteries. And um, if you look on the left, the traditional electrochemical battery is charged by electricity and then discharged by electricity. Whereas a thermal battery, as we've now been discussing and presenting, can take in heat energy from multiple heat sources, such as the waste heat, electricity, solar thermal, or steam, but also discharge 
directly to steam and processes. And this, of course, is very important for industrial applications. Cooling can be another aspect in which a thermal battery can offer some uh, a revenue stream. But also, as a tag on to that, is electricity combined with digital heating, or what's commonly called combined heating power. But I think also the main point of, um, to, uh, to stress when comparing a thermal battery to the norm traditional battery is the lifetime. Uh, uh, you know, the lifetime is five to seven years uh, for the, um, the normal electric battery, but the lifetime of this system is 30 years plus. So there is some great advantages beyond just how it's used. Comparing then um, uh, thermal batteries to other or more similar thermal energy storage applications, uh, we have presented, we have here a little chart and a table. And I'd like to draw your attention to the chart on the right side. Um, in, in this chart, we have graphed the typical operation in terms of temperature and also the duration of charge discharges on the bottom. And you can see that you know the hot water tanks and steam accumulators, um, which are quite commonly used in industry, they have um, they work quite well. Hot water is an extremely um, useful material to use, but of course you're limited to 100 and maybe 110 degrees and one one to one point five bars. Steam accumulators will take you up into 250 degrees Celsius, but you know due to the fact that it needs to be increasingly large to give you provide you a long discharge, then the capacity is the main limit. But also comparing to molten salt, which is really a uh, technology that is mature and also is commercially available in the market today, you will see that it can really extend into the 500 degrees plus. But the challenge here is actually at the lower end, um, because the molten salt needs to remain molten, so it doesn't actually operate at low temperatures, which is below, typically below 250 degrees. And also another point is to, to stress is that Molten salt uh, thermal energy storage systems are typically very large scale. The smallest one um, currently in, in operation is 730 megawatt hours, and that is a large system. So for industrial applications, I believe that our, you know, the, the solution of having a modular approach offers some great advantages with respect to scalability. So the next slide um, explains or shows how we have set up uh, a complete supply chain um, for on-demand delivery. Um, as Paul mentioned in his introduction, we can manufacture these uh, locally, but also centrally at the manufacturing hub. And this is what we currently have for the 20-foot unit. The steel cassettes are fabricated in the facility in Central Europe, um, according to standards and CE uh, marked uh, product requirements. Heat grid is manufactured by Hedberg Cement. And then we are putting this, this together at our manufacturing hub in, in Rotterdam, Europort, which is the central hub in Europe when it comes to uh, goods and um, transport of goods. So um, where the mixing is done, the casting, and then the handling and the loaded onto trucks for delivery through ocean, rail, or road. And the customer will then receive an as delivered product, which are these ready-made modules, which will then be assembled and connected into a turn complete turnkey system. So next, I'd like to talk a little bit about some examples um, and, and also to include some more details on how we can decarbonize uh, industry. When we're looking at industrialization, uh, industrial applications for thermal battery, we really like to differentiate them between three approaches. Um, the first one shown is where the thermal battery allows the uh, utilization of surplus renewable energy uh, to replace fossil fuels. This is sometimes called electrification of industry. And then the point here is that um, decarbonization is enabled by time shifting low cost electricity to the point where it has the highest value. So in that scenario, the thermal battery sits in the middle of an electric, um, it's fed by electric power and then discharges, for example, steam. The second case is the where a thermal battery allows recovery of variable variable waste heat, um, and the decoupling of recovery and use of waste then allows for potential multiple value streams for the industrial applications, such as waste heat in and steam generated out, and also electricity combined with uh, district heating as another revenue stream for, for for the industry. 
But lastly, and not the least, thermodide is also a very low cost alternative to molten salts. As I mentioned earlier, molten salt systems which are commercially available are very, very large scale systems. Um, but we are now seeing a transition where solar for industrial heat is coming up to enable low carbon production systems. And, um, and there is, you know, an immediate match between the solar uh, thermal energy and the storage uh, combined with producing steam and electricity for on-site um, needs. Now we're going to talk a little bit about these three examples or applications. And one is where you would have this electrification and decarbonization, as I mentioned. And here the thermal battery sits and is fed uh, by um, thermal energy generated by an electric boiler. And this could be typically for wind farms uh, in the middle of the night or excess PV during the day. Um, and also power, locals power from the market. Um, and in application then, you could see that it would sit in the middle and discharge um, up on demand for the industry, making the heat from the low cost renewable electric power available. And then some of the revenue streams are of course that you're displacing the use of natural gas and the related CO2 emissions. And also we do see in the long term trends why this is becoming a big hot topic in Europe is related to rising prices for natural gas, but certainly also CO2 will drive up the cost for generating heat. So this is what's called typical called power to heat. Next we have an example where we have a, a decarbonization of a brick manufacturer in Austria. What is um, the key here is that this is a brick production plant that has an industrial size waste heat recovery unit and they use a steam generator uh, for producing um, the bricks in one side of the factory. So the pictogram on the bottom shows how the thermal battery will sit between these two parts of the factory, extracting waste heat from the kiln and then later up on demand feeding that to the dryer, uh, which is then time shifting that energy but also generating steam to the other side of the plant, on the right side, uh, where the material is being processed. And this eliminates completely the use of natural gas on that side of the uh, production plant. And of course, the related CO2 emissions can be cut by as much as, for this case, uh, 2,000 tons of CO2 per, per year. So another example is so another example is what I mentioned previously about how a thermal battery can be used for industrial CSD, which is concentrated solar power. Um, and here we have uh, some information about the project we're currently executing for ENI, the Italian oil and gas company, which has now uh, launched, or I'm sorry, opened up, initiated one of their biorefineries in Europe in last year. And um, they're generating biofuels. And what they're doing there is integrating a CSP to uh, generate steam for parts of the processes. And this CSP runs, of course, during the day when the sun shines, but the processes run 24 7. So the thermal battery will then be charged the thermal energy and discharge energy to a, to a steam generator, ensuring constant supply of steam to the processes within the plant. Another example is a steel mill uh, where a thermal battery will enable elimination of a standby steam boiler. And this is um, an example where you see uh, in the pictogram here the, the graph, the red line represents the waste heat, the source power, but the demand, you can see the gray um, peaks there, and how it exceeds the, the power available at times. So, the thermal battery will then pr uh, charge continuously um, during uh, during operation, and since the since the power is uh, source is continuous, but it will up on demand discharge energy to generate steam, and then this for the degassing processes, and this um, then eliminates the use for natural gas for that specific process within the plant. And looking a little bit closer in the details, what this really dials down to is that the high temperature exhaust gases, which are relatively continuous, by itself could not feed the processes required for the degassing process, 
the thermal battery of 20 megawatt thermal then will provide this energy required to generate the steam. And this you can see as an example here would then offset more than 6,000 tons per year of CO2 just by displacing that boiler. Another example is a brick factory. It's not the same as in Austria, but this is a um, slightly different one, but it's very similar, um, where a thermal battery replaces the steam boiler feeding the brick extrusion and provides heat again for the dryer. And in the graph, you can see how the demand or the waste heat, the red line, how the demand um, some is very variable in time and at certain peaks exceeds the available power. But when it really comes to play for the thermal battery and it's when the steam generated demand is added to the air heated demand. And that's what's shown in the right side of the graph where the blue or the accumulated blue and then gray demand vastly or uh, exceeds the uh, available heat source. And this is where the thermal battery comes in and then provides the required energy. And again, this also then, looking at the details, is quite quite effectful in terms of um, providing a value to the customer, um, quite favorable IRRs, but also again in terms of the decarbonization, it's a saving of more than 6,000 tons per year. So now we have come to the end of the presentation and it's the point at where we uh, would like to open up for questions. Um, thank you very much, uh, Paul and um, Nils. Uh, I really appreciate your presentation here, and I'm sure you are our um, attendees as well. We have received some questions, and I managed to prioritize quite a few. Uh, I actually added some more uh, that I had uh, some, some questions about. Um, I would like to start with uh, David Campbell's question. Uh, he is asking, Regarding maintenance of the batteries, how do you deal with and identify the cracks in the concrete during service? Also, can you give an idea of what typical maintenance routines would be on the batteries throughout their design life? Thank you very much. Okay, I, uh, I understand the question. I will answer about the maintenance and Paul can answer about the cracks. Mm -hmm. So with respect to maintenance, the battery itself is maintenance free. What it con uh, comprised of is a steel pipe embedded in the concrete. And uh, so there's no uh, moving parts, there's no chemical transitions, there's nothing to replace, so the battery itself is maintenance free. With respect to maintenance of the overall system, it will be related to the valves and the individual instruments uh, that's part of the control loop. Yes, and I, I think I also mentioned that um, when we cut up uh, our pilot in Abu Dhabi, uh, we didn't see a single crack. So uh, the concrete was completely intact. And that, of course, has to do with the, the stress level and the fact that also the stress cycling is at a level which is um, much lower than the capacity of the concrete. Another thing to add there is also it's a very beneficial type of um, load cycle because it's what we call proportional loading. It's not like in a, when you have a concrete bridge and you have a vehicle driving over it, you know, you have bending and then you have shear and you have crack openings and uh, across the uh, cracks uh, and a cra a shear transfer across the cracks. Uh, in this case, uh, as I said, it's um, a very beneficial uh, stress cycling with proportional loading without any rotation of the principal stresses. So we haven't seen any cracking. We have done some analysis of consequence of cracking, for instance, at the interface between heat exchangers uh, and concrete. And if we take the worst case of uh, cooling uh, in, in the heat exchangers and having a hot uh, concrete uh, part in, in the elements, we see that these cracks are much thinner than hair thin. So, and we, when we do the analysis, even a small crack opening there will have almost no effect. So, 
So we are very confident that um, the storage will need very little maintenance. In fact, all the more complex parts that has to do with valves and uh, possibly pumps and that sort of thing are on the outside. So on the inside, the insulated uh, storage, you know, you have extremely low um, uh, humidity. Uh, it, it's drier than the sauna, <laughs> so to speak. So uh, it's um, we, we 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 don't expect um, maintenance problem of the storage is, itself. But of course, piping and valves um, on the outside may need some inspection and the maintenance. Excellent. That that that's quite safe design in that case then. Um, Another question, uh, this is from Simon Cottery. Um, is the flow path for the heating medium the same for fluid providing the heat during discharging and the fluid removing the heat during discharge? I'm sorry, I don't, well, think, I, I don't think I've caught the first part. What was the first part? Um, is the flow path for the heating medium the same for fluid providing the heat? So, yeah, yeah. Yes, normally, you know, it's the the same heat exchanger system that we use to feed in the heat and extract the heat. Yeah. Uh, and when we do uh, thermal oil, we, uh, we we just simply reverse uh, the flow, direction of flow. Yeah. In case of uh, two-phase with uh, water steam, it's different. Yeah. Okay. Okay. The the next question from Gintas uh, Kasinskas. Uh, what are the rough efficiencies of converting various energies to thermal energy and then converting it back? So overall, the efficiency of the heat exchanger and the thermal battery is quite high. This is you know 98 percent, 97, 98 percent. It's in terms of heat to heat. If you were to consider the case of electricity in and thermal out. This is uh, also relatively um, efficient. I mean, this is a matter of heating and oil using a liquid heater. So that's also very, very high efficiency. What, and also heat in. So heat in, heat out, and power in and heat out is very, very close to, uh, to heat efficiency, uh, to unit one except for the thermal losses of a system. But if you were to compare to um, you know, like heat in, electricity out, you, I mean, it's hard to be thermodynamics. So you will have a lower efficiency. It will be down in the 30s and below. So it's not really beneficial to generate electricity explicitly only from heat. Electricity has a value if it's an add-on to the, to the dominant or the, um, the main feature of the storage system. Mm -hmm. So the combination of heat and power can be, you know, 85 yeah, percent or 70 to 80, 85 yeah. percent, depending on yeah. how you how you configure it. Okay, that, that, that's okay. 80, 85 percent would would be our answer here then. Um, we have another question here from Colin Warburton. This looks like a super modern version of the old storage radiators that we all got rid of years ago. Simple, clever work. Is it suitable for domestic use? Is it a better alternative than heat pumps? So to answer that question, I'd like to address it by the last part of the question. For, for domestic use, hot water is the number one storage. No, we, there, there's no point in trying to do anything at very high uh, temperatures. However, for industrial applications where you're offsetting the use of natural gas, as in the case of a steam boiler, and the higher the temperature, the higher the exergy and the higher the value. But for residential use, it's not really uh, any point competing against a water tank, which is extremely efficient and quite well commercially available. Yeah, that's okay. right. There, there may be situations where, you know, the, the heat is utilized in, in different stages. And, of course, with lower and lower temperature, and at the end of this yeah. stream, uh, the, the temperature may be suitable for district heating and that yeah. sort of thing. Yeah, that's true. Excellent. Uh, we have so many questions coming in after this. Uh, I'll <laughs> try to go through this. Uh, honestly, so many. Thank you all very much for submitting your questions. Um, I will uh, get one from James Paulington. It looks like heat residency is 15 hours or so. 
does the rule out use for international interseasonal storage? So if I repeat it again, it looks like heat residency yeah. is 15 hours or so. Does that yeah, rule yeah. out used for interseasonal storage? Yeah. So with respect to interseasonal storage or, or very few cycles, what is important to consider is that the revenue is not based upon the storage and uh, the charging the storage. It's purely based on discharging storage. So the higher the number of cycles, the larger the revenue stream and the lower, or lower, shorter the payback time. So for interseasonal storage, one should really look at al other alternatives. And for instance, you know, for district heating, they have used these water magazines and water tanks, etc. So for interseasonal storage, it's not necessarily optimal. No. No, uh, that, that's oh. as Neil is saying, you know, that because there are so few cycles, mm. but there may be settings. <clears throat> and of course, you can run different parts of the storage in, in different ways. Let's say you have an energy surplus generated during um, weekends, right? And you can shift that to uh, weekdays uh, later on. So it can very well, with the same storage, be a combination of daily cycles or multiple daily cycles, also with, let's say, week, weekly offsetting. Hmm. Um, so that is uh, important to know, actually. OK. Um, I'm trying to sift through these uh, questions and pick the ones that we didn't already answer. Um, Somebody is a sim to raise asking, is the heat creed cured and tested like normal concrete? Yes, it's actually, um, in that sense, it's um, uh, <laughs> like a normal concrete, but uh, also the answer is no. But, well, first of all, as I mentioned, that we, uh, <clears throat> in, in normal concretes, there is quite a bit more water than. Um, uh, gets uh, you know chemically bound to hydrates, so uh, there's a lot of additional water that you know results in pores in the concrete. Our concrete, the heatcrete, which we developed together with um, uh, Heidelberg cement, has a very low water content. You know, let's say six seven percent. So there are uh, additives that makes it uh, workable with such low uh, water can, uh, content. And also, as I mentioned, you know, we do the conditioning. And the conditioning process, which is heating it above, well, the boiling point of water, and we get this, the additional unbound water um, out of the concrete, that has an effect on the strength of the concrete. And that is, we believe, uh, due to the um, uh, vapor pressure uh, at higher temperature that actually forces more water into the fine cement, cement grains and makes the concrete stronger. Excellent. Um, I think that's, that's a great answer. And I will move on to David Neal's question. The pictures of the batteries appear to show the individual tubes not to be insulated. Is this the case for the finished insulation? And if so, why not insulate the external surfaces? So the answer to that is, you're right. They are externally insulated. If, um, if going back to the slide number 13, I'm not sure if I can do that. But yes, the individual modules are connected together, stacked on top of each other, and then thermal insulation, such as mineral wool, is then added all around the modules. And then outside the mineral wool, there is normal uh, steel sliding to protect, protect it from the environment, such as rain and wind. Okay. Um, also, me... it could be added that you know the, the surface, the volume factor is important. So, a large storage will have relatively smaller heat loss than uh, a small storage, of course. Uh, can I add to that question? And what would be the typical U value that you are uh, designing these for for the heat loss? So it depends entirely on application uh, because you know the higher the temperature, the more insulation material you need. Um, typical 
if you were to look at example systems that would operate with daily cycles, uh, you know, accumulating energy over 12 hours, discharges then again over 12 hours, um, it's different from a system that's operating with three to four hours and discharging uh, and much, much later. You need to insulate it well better. Typical insulation thickness is 300 millimeter to 600 millimeter insulation. Okay. okay. Rock, okay. Rock, rock wool. Mineral, mineral wool. Yeah. So significant insulation applied on it if needs be then in that case. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. Budila is asking, can this system be used to recover and store heat from a biomass boiler to heat the inlet feed water? Yes. Yes. <laughs> That's a simple, quick answer. <laughs> yeah, but, but of course, we would need to understand a bit more. But the answer is yes. If if you have waste heat, you can accumulate that, and you can also use it to preheat feed water again on the other side. But you can also reduce the extraction of uh, uh, extract stream extractions from the generator if you wish to do that. That's also another way to optimize or increase the efficiency. So you look at the applications case by case and provide some uh, custom solutions to customers then. Correct. The, the okay. interesting thing is that the modules are more or less the same, but the way we configure it and, and you know the number of modules needed depends on the specific case. Mm. And of course, there's a uh, significant difference between direct steam storage and um, thermal oil. Yep. But thermal oil could also be used for this particular application where you waste the exchange with the thermal oil and then you use that again and then the heat exchange to preheat the feed water. Absolutely. Yep. Great. Okay. Um, I am not sure if you asked this, but uh, get, um, let me see. Ali Kuba is asking, is the thermal energy stored in a liquid within the heat crate or is this heat crate itself? Um, how frequently do you need to start uh, maintenance? I think you already answered this question. You mentioned the thermal fluid uh, running through the pipes, um, yep. and the maintenance is really not required. Right. So, uh, so I, I is add, add, add the comment there, if I, uh, if you please. Um, of course. The, the, you, you know, uh, heat is um, a rather uh, concentrated form of energy. Uh, if you look at the energy you can store in this heat grid, let's say in one cubic meter of heat grid, um, and compare that, uh, and let's say you have a delta T, delta temperature of uh, 100 degrees, and if you compare that with taking the same one cubic meter of concrete and hoist it up 100 meters, and then, of course, you get the potential energy. When you compare the two uh, 100 degrees heating with 100 meters of lifting it up in the air, the heat energy is 100 times, more than 100 times, the, the potential energy. So that's, uh, you know, you may have seen some uh, concepts where they look at hoisting up some concrete and stuff, but... Yeah. Uh, heat is amazingly efficient, I would say. Um, I think I'll have to ask almost the last question here. Um, Yusuf Iqbal is asking, uh, hi, to lower carbon em emissions uh, during transporting 45 ton individual modules to distant locations, won't it be more environmentally friendly to transport all the parts except the concrete to the site and then make the concrete on location and assemble modules on site? Mm -hmm. It's it's an inter interesting question, and I appreciate uh, that you present that. Yes, we have looked at it, and uh, that's why Paul mentioned initially. For some applications, it may be more beneficial, both economically but also from an environmental point of view, to do casting on site. But if you are looking at the industrial applications where there's typically smaller storage systems uh, designed to fit into complex industrial facilities. The answer is actually no. Then it's more economical and also a smaller footprint to to produce them centrally uh, in the manufacturing hub, which is more efficient than setting up a big plant for a very small project. So it entirely depends on the project. But this that's also yeah. the yeah. flexibility we have. 
Yeah, the project size, I suppose, will define. Uh, will it be beneficial to do it that way or not, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. Another question, maybe. This is this will be the final one because um, I will have to close the session shortly. Emmanuel Johnny is asking: Can we use these battery units as an alternative or as a regenerative system for district energy systems? Yeah, I think by district energy systems, you mean district heating? Presumably. Yeah. I can't get clarification on that. Um, uh, okay. If it's not clear well, to it, you, then. <laughs> it all depends on, you know, as Nils uh, was saying earlier on, if it's, uh, let's say, below 120 degrees, then you can have a water tank or pressurized water tank. Uh, and you know, we don't even intend to compete with that. But if you're talking about um, waste heat uh, or systems that is in the higher temperature range, certainly it can be used in, in such a way. Um, probably relates to that question. I will just get this one out. Uh, Luke Northover is asking, what would be the ideal temperature range for this uh, design? So the ideal temperature range, um, what we showed in, in one of the graphs was um, going up to 400, 450 degrees plus. If you're above 400 degrees, you need 427 degrees, you need a different kind of steel. So the piping material using carbon steel, which is the most economical, has an upper temperature range of 420 degrees, uh, 27 to be exact. So a typical ideal operating range would be um, charging at 400 degrees, discharging as low as 200, then you get a huge delta T and you really get the benefit of the modular design. Excellent. But we, we um, can also operate at higher temperatures and, uh, you know, we are looking at applications uh, much higher than that. Yeah, but then you need to use different kinds of steels in all the piping. Excellent. Um, I'm sure people have uh, received your contact information here. I'm, I'm hoping uh, they won't need to write it down because they will receive the presentation anyway. Um, but there are so many questions we couldn't get to answer. I will try to get these to you uh, by email or something, and uh, we will facilitate, facilitate answering these uh, uh, directly later on, hopefully. Um, and I'd like to thank you both for presenting for us. Uh, it's been really great presentation and uh, so much interaction from the audience as well. Uh, as uh, I'm a key Northwest region, Power Industries Division and Greater Manchester Area uh, Networks, we would like to thank you for your presentation. Um, I also would like to close it with um, highlighting uh, who has participated to this event. Uh, again, Emma Pateman, Fiona Wong, uh, Dr. David Paul, and myself, Murat Islam, and also Steve Alban from uh, Energy Nest uh, have helped facilitating this event. Um, I would like you to follow us on LinkedIn and uh, sign up to our events. Uh, you know the websites. We put the links here for your benefit. And if you would like to get involved with the Institutional Mechanical Engineers, please uh, feel free to contact us, reach us, and uh, benefit from these various various things we, we would like to offer to you as well. Um, we have about two minutes to go. Um, I'd like to sort of close this here, but uh, would you be happy if I asked you maybe one more question, maybe a couple of questions before we close? Sure, no, of course. Um, you see, I've run through this a lot quicker than I expected, so <laughs> may as well may as well ask him a couple of questions. So, is oh, Daniel Allen is asking: Is any internal inspection of the steel pipes required? The answer to that is no. No. Okay, so okay. during manufacturing, everything is checked. Obviously, it's in manufacturing. Once it's supplied, you don't need any maintenance to further check what is going on with the pipes again. Correct. Okay. Um, course, how long the can the thermal testing is done in uh, advance? Yeah, Excellent. Like Excellent. Um, Hen Henning Feingand is asking how long can the thermal energy be stored without having heavy losses? For example, yeah. lower than ten percent loss. Yeah. So for a large scale system, the thermal losses uh, are about two to three percent per twenty four hours. 
For smaller Excellent. systems where the volume to surface ratio is of course less unfavorable, um, can't bend physics, the thermal losses will be a little bit higher and that's why we said in that, those cases you would need to add a little bit more thermal insulation. But you can bank on Excellent. somewhere between 5% for 24 hours. Yeah, even then uh, to say or we can add insulation mm -hmm. to also. Yeah. And so uh, that brings good. us to <laughs> that that then brings us to seven o'clock. So I think it is probably the time to close the event. So thank you again for your presentation and uh, thank you all very much. Okay, so our pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.